Hello and welcome back. In the previous video, we saw how we can induce an EMF and hence a current in a coil by moving the coil or moving the magnet near a coil or spinning the magnet. Now we're getting ready to look at a little more formal definition of this with the introduction of a magnetic flux, which will then lead us to Faraday's law. We'll first talk about what a magnetic flux is. It tends to be a little bit of a confusing topic. Then we will see what the required conditions are to induce a current or an EMF in a coil, which will then lead us to what Faraday's law is all about. Okay, let's talk about flux. And I'm going to start the discussion of flux talking about what it is not. If I just asked you before you took this course or before we introduced this topic to you what flux is, a lot of you might tell me that flux is change. After all, you do hear this word used in common language where it seems to denote a frequent change of a situation. So, for example, the news reporter might say the situation relating to the current variant of COVID is in a state of flux, meaning we're not sure what's going on. Things are changing pretty rapidly. Well, in physics, and in fact, even in English, if you look at the dictionary, flux is not change. You want to think of flux as a flow. And the way we use it in common language where it denotes change, if you think about it this way, it's also talking about the fact that things are flowing pretty fast and that is why they're changing. The situation is in a state of flow. It's not static, which is why it is changing. So we think of it as change, but it's not change. And that's really important for you to understand because in this video, we're going to be talking about the change in flux. Okay, so we're going to talk about how the flux itself can change and why that is important and how we use that. So please get it out of your mind that flux is change. It's not. Flux is flow. Let's talk a little more specifically about what that means. So let's say it's raining. So there's a lot of raindrops coming down from the sky and you put a circular ring horizontally under the rain to catch it. So in this case, you're going to have a lot of rain that goes through your circular hoop. So if this was the top of a bucket, you would actually collect a lot of rainwater in your bucket. Well, let's take the same situation, same rain, same amount of rain coming down. But now you place the loop like this vertically. So hopefully you see my three dimensional representation here. So here I'm placing the loop vertically and trying to catch the rain. How much of the rain am I going to catch now? Well, it's going to be none of it because all the rain is going to go to one side of it or the other side of it or hit the very top of it and bounce off. So in this case, I will catch no rain when it's vertical. And when it's horizontal, I'll catch the maximum rain. And if I hold in the same situation with the same rain, if I hold this loop at some angle between vertical and horizontal, I'm going to catch some of the rain, but not as much as I would when it's horizontal. So now I'm catching some of the rain. And so this will be at an angle, catch some medium amount. And when it was vertical, we caught not, no rain. So in physics, and when we talk about magnetic field, this is the flux we're talking about. So instead of rain, we're going to have magnetic field lines going through a current loop. And we are going to be discussing how much of the magnetic field lines in totality is going through the loop. So let's look at that. Let's say the magnetic field is coming out of the page and I have a current loop that is lying like this. Let's say it's a circular loop. So this is going to catch some of these magnetic field lines that go through that surface. But in the same situation, if I have the magnetic field lines coming out of the page and I turn the loop by 90 degrees and make it vertical like this, so I've moved this end out of the screen and this end into the screen to turn it vertical, now it's going to catch none of the magnetic field lines. And if it's at an angle, it's going to catch some. So magnetic flux, it's denoted by the Greek letter phi, capital phi, and it's the total amount of magnetic field passing through the current loop, or really a loop in which current will be induced. We're not passing current in this loop by connecting it to a battery. It's just a loop of wire 
in which current will be generated and we're going to see the conditions needed to generate that current. So calling it a current loop is really an anticipation of the fact that there's going to be some current induced. So you can see a couple of things right away. If the area of the loop is small, so in this case I've got a small area, in this case I've got a larger area, the large area is going to catch more than the small. If the magnetic field is stronger, there's going to be more caught by the loop or more, more magnetic field in total passing through the loop if the magnetic field is strong as opposed to weak. And then if the angle is 90 degrees, then you won't catch any. So the angle is important. So what we talk about in this context is that the flux is equal to the magnitude of the magnetic field times the effective area of the loop. And what we mean by effective area is that it's not just the area that matters. In this case, A1 was bigger than A2, so that was catching more of the magnetic field. But A1 placed this way will catch no magnetic field lines, so the orientation matters, which is where this word effective comes from. And the way we measure the effective area is based on the angle between these two. And to explain that, let me take a slightly different orientation. It's easier to visualize it if I have this orientation. So now I have magnetic field lines going from left to right, like shown here. And I have got an area, let me take a square area, that's placed that way, perpendicular to the magnetic field lines, so it'll catch the maximum. So all these magnetic field lines going through this area will pass through it, and so the flux will be the magnetic field times the area of this loop. But if I turn this area and hold it this way, horizontally, when you have the magnetic field lines going this way, now it's going to catch none. So in this case, A effective has to be zero. In this case, A effective, when it's held perpendicular, capturing as much as it can, will be equal to the actual area of the loop itself. And if it's at some angle in between, there's going to be a value in between. So to visualize this more easily, I'm going to show you just the projection on 2D of what you would see rather than trying to show you the third dimension as I've been doing so far. So if I have magnetic field lines that are going from left to right and I have a loop, a square or rectangular loop that I'm holding vertically, it'll look like this. And at this point, it's going to maximize the amount of magnetic field lines going through it. If I take the same magnetic field lines, but I rotate my loop to, so it's horizontal, it's going to catch none. And let's say I have some same magnetic field lines, but I have now an angle at which this loop is being held, so it's neither vertical nor horizontal, but there's an angle. So now it's going to capture a medium amount. Okay, so this will be max, this will be zero, and this will be middle. Well, the way we define the specifics or the mathematics of this is when we have an area we talk about the direction of that area being along a normal line to that area itself. So this is a 90 degree angle to the area, and then we measure the angle between that normal line of the area and the magnetic field. So in this case, magnetic fields are horizontal, so this angle here is theta. So the direction of the area is along the line that's perpendicular to the area, that's how it's defined mathematically, and then the angle between that and the external magnetic field line is given this value theta. So in this case, the normal to that area is like this, and the magnetic field line passes through it, so theta is zero. In this case, the area normal to the area is like that, the magnetic field line passes through this, so in this case, theta is 90 degrees, okay? Now, based on this representation, the effective area is defined as the actual area times cosine of the angle theta. So in this case, in the first case where the theta is zero, you see that cosine of zero is just simply one, so the effective area is simply going to be A. The other extreme, when it's 90 degrees, cosine of 90 degrees is zero, so in this case I'm going to have effective area of zero, and in the middle I will have effective area would be A times cosine of theta. So this is the general equation that is true in all cases, but we saw that specifically cosine theta became one when the angle is zero, 
cosine theta became zero when the angle is 90 degrees, and when it's something in between, it's just going to be whatever it is, cosine theta times A will be the effective area. So bringing that home to the definition of magnetic flux, it was equal to effective area times B, which would be equal to A times B times cosine of theta. A effective is just A times cosine theta, and just by convention, I move the cosine theta term to the end. A cosine theta times B is the same as AB cosine theta. The SI units of magnetic flux would be the SI units of area, which would be meter squared times Tesla times cosine of theta has no units. So we write the unit of this as Tesla meter squared, and that's called Weber. W-E-B-E-R, the short form for it is capital W and lowercase b. So that's the SI unit of magnetic flux. This phi here is magnetic flux, which you can think of as total amount of magnetic field flowing through a loop. And finally, this brings us to Faraday's law. As we saw in the last video, Faraday did a lot of these experiments playing with magnets and loops and measured the currents going through them. And based on his experiments, he came up with this law where he said that an EMF is induced in a loop when and only when the magnetic flux through the loop changes. So here we go. I promised you that we'll be talking about the change in the flux, which is what we're doing here. Magnetic flux is the total amount of magnetic field flowing through the area. And when that changes, there is an EMF induced in the loop. And when there's an EMF induced in the loop, as long as the circuit is complete, there's going to be a current induced in the loop. And Faraday came up with a mathematical expression. The induced EMF, epsilon induced, was equal to the change in flux over the change in time. So this is giving us the value of the induced EMF without telling us which end is positive, which end is negative. We're going to talk about that in the next video. But as far as Faraday's law is concerned, we get the um, value, the magnitude of the potential difference that's created to facilitate a current when the flux through a loop changes. So if I have a certain amount of change in a certain amount of time, I divide the change in the flux by the change in the time to get the induced EMF. So how can I change the flux? Well, I can change it multiple ways. If I have a loop over here, I can change the flux by moving a magnet closer to the loop, which will increase the strength of the magnetic field going through the loop and hence change the flux. Or I can do the same thing by moving the magnet farther away, which will weaken the magnetic field going through the loop. And so I can change the uh, flux through the loop. Or I can change the area of the loop itself, make the loop bigger or smaller without moving the magnet. Or the third way I can do it is by changing the angle between the two. So if I place a magnet here and spin the magnet in near a loop or spring, spin the loop near a magnet, in all those three situations, I will change the magnetic flux, which means I will induce an EMF and hence induce a current. In the next video, we'll talk about the direction of that current and how we can determine that using something called Lenz's Law. All right, so in this video, we talked about magnetic flux, which is the total amount of magnetic field that flows through an area. We reminded ourselves that flux here does not mean change. It depends on three things. It depends on the strength of the magnetic field, the area of the loop, and the angle between them. It's denoted by the capital Greek letter phi, and it's measured in Tesla meter square in SI units, which is also called Weber. The symbol is WB. And a current and an EMF are both induced in the coil when the magnetic flux through the coil changes. So the magnetic flux has to change in order to induce an EMF. And Faraday's law gave us a mathematical expression for what that induced EMF was. So delta phi over delta t, absolute value of it was the induced EMF. Thank you.